Now the story I'm going to tell you today is a story 14 years in the making. It's about log rafting down the Yukon River on these giant log rafts. Now this is my story to tell in part, but this is also my wife Brooke's story. This is Laro Eklund, and this is his story too. But most of all, this is the story of this man, Neil Eklund. Now Neil came up to Alaska in the 70s. He ran remote trap lines. He lived in the deep bush by himself through harsh winters. He ran the Iditarod a couple times. Neil also used to mine mammoth ivory and fossils out of the frozen banks of the rivers. Now one of the things that Neil did that really set him apart from a lot of the other adventures was he had a real soft spot for log rafts. He'd build log rafts every chance he got, just the way that the pioneers did a hundred years ago. Spike them together and float them down the Yukon River. Back in the spring of 2000, Brooke and I had just got done with our winter in the Aleutian Islands, caretaking a remote homestead. As luck would have it, this was also the same year that Neil put all of his resources together and built one giant log raft. He would actually bring in tourists and people got to experience floating down the river on a log raft. Neil kitted out his rafts with very nice lodging and great food. And like so many people would love to do, he took something that was unique to him and turned it into a business. That summer, Brooke and I were living in Fairbanks and Brooke saw that Neil had an ad in the paper looking for help on the law graft. She applied and was immediately hired. All that summer, Brooke and Neil would take people not only down the river on the law graft, but also up tributaries doing pike fishing and sightseeing. The one and only Alaska log raft safari, probably the only log raft safari in the entire world, and Neil was just the guy for it. Talk about a person in his element, that was Neil Eklund. I decided to start up a small concrete construction business that summer, so I didn't spend as much time on the raft, but I did get to come out and spend a bit of time. We ran up the Melanzitna River and did a bunch of fishing, and Neil started a tradition of always catching the biggest fish, a tradition that I'm still not comfortable with to this very day. There's nothing like the smell of wood smoke and white canvas. Time well spent with good friends, floating down a beautiful river in a wild and scenic corner of the world. Now when the 2000 log rafting season had finally wrapped up, it was a long winter of, of sitting around and making plans to get out on the water for 2001. It was about this time the tragedy struck. Neil was diagnosed with having throat cancer. Everything that had happened that summer needed to be put on the back burner. You can see that Laro in this picture is just a little guy. He couldn't have been more than three. Now Neil had this great battle to fight in life. But he did fight it. And he did win. With a lot of prayers and a VA hospital surgery, Neil beat throat cancer and made a full recovery. But by this time, the business had been put on the back burner too long. The tourists were gone. It was a time to rebuild in life. But Neil would take every opportunity he could and get out on the water, even if the log raft had to be a little small log raft. As Laura was growing up, Neil and Laura would sell firewood on their trips down the river to help finance the, the adventure. The rafts were a lot smaller, and the business was a distant memory. But some dreams, they're just too good to let go. Some slices of life are, they're, they're too unique you just can't get beyond them. Now the years went by and Laro grew up and Brooke and I had kids of our own too. And just like Neil, I had to fight a debilitating illness. I went from 225 pounds down to 140 with a rare stomach condition. Only a surgery and at Mayo Clinic and a lot of prayers saved my life. But just like Neil, I made a full recovery. Well, life rolls on and plans change. But every spring, one thing stayed the same. Brooke and Neil and myself, we would talk about the possibility of getting the log rafting business going again. Building another giant raft and booking in people from all over the world to come and see what it's like to float down the mighty Yukon River.
It was June in the year 2014. Neil got a call that the National Geographic Channel was interested in doing a documentary about his time on the Yukon. About the whole lifestyle of, of law grafting on that beautiful stretch of river. Right from the beginning, we were all in. It's amazing and kind of surreal to have a dream that's been put on the back burner for that long brought right back out to life to be doing that thing you've been talking about doing for so long. This time we would be accompanied down the river by a camera crew. Now the thought of being on TV was pretty neat, but what really mattered was just the triumph of the whole thing. The feeling that you're reclaiming lost time, getting back out on the water and doing something that you just love to do. Now here's how the process actually worked. We would take our skiffs up the river from the Yukon River Bridge and find these large logs that were left high and dry on the shore during the spring runoff. We would roll these logs down into the river after knocking off all the limbs and taking off the ends. We'd collect these logs up in big bundles and tie them to the side of the skiffs and then motor them back downstream to the Yukon River Bridge where we were actually going to build our log rafts. Gotta pay attention boating on the Yukon. That's an entire spruce tree floating down the river, root ball and all. Here's an interesting side note. One day while we were collecting logs off the side of the river, I found this old piece of a native Alaskan birch bark canoe. We took this canoe and put it on our log raft once the raft was finished and floated it downstream with us. It stayed the winter at Neil's trapping cabin outside of Ruby, and in the spring we donated it to the Tanana Chiefs Association in Fairbanks. On kind of a sad note, when we donated this canoe to the Tanana Chiefs Association, they didn't seem very interested in it at all. From the way they treated it, it was pretty obvious it was just going to end up in a box in the basement. Well, not only did we need big logs for the raft itself, but we needed a lot of poles for cross members and tent poles. I don't know about you, but I think the sight of a bunch of wet logs bobbing in the river all roped together is just a thing of beauty. These are the logs that would later on become our log raft. You can see we're actually starting to get it built. It's taking shape. In the background there, Laura was using a pike pole. For hundreds of years, loggers used pike poles to move logs around out on the water. You can stab a log or you can hook it. A pike pole is just indispensable. Now although log rafting is Neil's thing, and this show was going to be built around Neil and his experiences, we weren't the only crew that was going to build log raft and float it down the river. In this picture you could see in the background two more log rafts being built. Now ours was clicking along pretty good at this point. You can see we're feeding logs into the center. We've got most of our cross members all laid up. Once all the cross members were on, we'd deck the rest of the raft with 2x4s and plywood. You know, it's about all you can ask for in this life to make a living doing something that you enjoy so much and uh, have had years and years of boating and building stuff with logs and chainsaws and then to have a crew following us around filming that and it was going to be shared with the world. I never felt like I was doing something I was more perfectly fitted to it. And to have other people appreciate it and be so interested in it, it was just a, an amazing experience. Now you can see here, Laurel was putting together the gang plank. This is the movable plank that we would put down between the shore and the raft so we can get on and off shore without getting wet. Very important piece of equipment. Now it took us around 10 days to build and outfit our raft and during that time we had some of the greatest weather you could hope to have. Fall in Alaska is truly magnificent. Some nights it did get really chilly. I mean, we'd have ice in the puddles in the bottom of the boat. But all in all, lots of blue skies, lots of beautiful sunsets. You can see here we've got the cook tent on the end of the raft put up, and the tent next to it was where Brooke and I and the kids would stay. On the other end of the raft, we put two 10 by 12 tents, one for the camera crew, one for Neil and Laro. Looking down the beach here, you can see two other log rafts. The first one was built by Scotty Lampkin, Charles Keeter, and Lance Kramer. In this picture, Scotty's on the right and Charles is in the center. Now, old Scotty and I became pretty good friends on this trip. Like Neil, Scotty was one of these guys that came up back in the day and really lived life. 
a guy with a lot of real experience and a lot of great stories. He was just really good company. Now this double-decker raft on the end was built by two guys named Andrew Bunker and Josh Tuzanaw. Couple fellas with a lot of smarts and a lot of creativity. That's a really cool raft. Now the headquarters for this operation was this place, the Yukon River Camp. It was kind of a restaurant and some ATCO units put together. It's kind of like a man camp motel type of thing. And it sure was a great time to come in after a long day of logging and working on the raft, have a good meal and sit down with some good friends and just relax and enjoy the evening. And there's a great father and son picture of Neil and Laurel. Bell and Mick really enjoyed this part of the trip. They were both born in Fairbanks and we drug them along fishing for ever since they were just little. We'd all go out to our fishing camp in Minto Flats and ride around in the old boat fishing for pike. So staying in wall tents was kind of old news to these guys. They were old hands at it. But a nice warm restaurant, good food and endless ice cream, they thought that was the bomb. Now this fellow's a local guy named Jeremy. He had a 14 horse Mercury outboard that would not go into reverse. I spent about an hour one afternoon fixing his outboard for him and, and to say thanks he gave me a black bear skull and a fifth of really cheap whiskey. Now way down the river if you were to get in a pinch a fifth of whiskey would be a pretty good bargaining tool so it actually was quite a gift. Now these fellas were our camera crew that was going to be accompanying us down the river on our log raft. Scott Messier and Tony Pontello had spent time filming for the deadliest catch out in the Bering Sea. And Juan Nunes was a sound engineer from Los Angeles, California. These guys turned out to be tough as nails and they took to bush life like a duck to water. Not only that, but they were all super cool people and just great company. Well, the day finally came that we had everything done and we were ready to shove off and launch the rafts. The tents were up, all the gear was stowed, the boats were gassed up. It's just an amazing feeling to be at the very start of a trip like that down the river. And what better time to do it? September in Alaska is truly one of the greatest times of the year. Scotty Lampkin's raft was ready to go too, and Scotty was itching to see the rest of the river. Here's Laura doing the honors of shoving the raft off for the first time with a pike pole. Now what we would do is we would use the skiffs and the outboards to maneuver the raft around or push it into shore for the night. You can see here Neil's using his homemade boat and his 50 horse Honda to push the raft out into the center of the current for the very first time. Once we had the raft underway it was time to pull up the sail and raise the flags. What a beautiful sight. Scotty, Charles and Lance left the same day that we did and so did Josh and Andrew. You have to admit that the weather was still holding out great and it was beautiful almost every day. You're almost guaranteed a good sunset each evening. And then when the sun went down, there's hardly anything in the world more beautiful than a wall tent lit up from the inside with a Coleman lantern sitting on a wild piece of river in the middle of nowhere. Now one of the things that's such a hallmark about floating a log raft is how peaceful it is. That part of the world has almost no air traffic and not much boat traffic. A lot of stretches of that river are dead silent. Sometimes you hear silence for the first time in your life if you're out there. Just beautiful, gorgeous fall weather. After having built that log raft, every one of us was just put out and whooped. And we spent several days just lounging around doing absolutely nothing. Now you take a sunny day like this and you catch yourself a nap out in the boat just listening to the water rippling around the logs. It's just an amazing experience. Now those first few days out on the water, it sure was a nice chance to unwind and catch up and relax. Now check that out. Electric blue sky and fresh white canvas. There's a look of a guy right there who's had some dreams come true. I think that's truly the portrait of a happy man. Now every evening we would get together and have our dinner in the cook tent. Warm lighting and we had a stove in there and it was very nice and toasty. Great place to get together for a nice meal at the end of the day. What a setting. Speaking of dinner, 
fishing was a big part of our food out there on the Yukon. And every time we found a decent creek, we would always stop and fish it. Now here's Neil keeping that tradition alive of always catching the biggest fish. That's son of a gun. Now later on in the trip, we would do a lot of set netting. We'd catch salmon and she fish and pike out of the river. And also sometimes we would set out a line and catch a burbot or two. Now here's a Yukon River picnic. Frying up some fish outside on the deck of the raft on a beautiful afternoon on the Yukon. Now parking the log raft in the evening was always an interesting time. You know, you're in wild country here. In this pic, Bell's making a plaster cast of a wolf track. Mick and Bell found this tussock, which is just a big clump of grass. And they put fake eyes on it and some moss hair and called it Fred. Now Fred would end up floating with us all the rest of the way down the river as our kind of raft mascot, Fred the Tussock. One thing I really enjoyed about this trip was all the visiting. There were a lot of times when all of us were in the same place at the end of the evening. So we'd park our rafts close to each other and just go visit. Not only would you get to visit the guys from the other log rafts, but you'd also get to visit the, the other camera crews. And there were always a lot of good stories and you're catching up at the end of the day from what everyone had been through during that course of the float. Bonfires were a big part of life on the river. This time of the year, the water was so low that the banks were chucked full of bone dry driftwood. Good company, wild country, and endless firewood. What more could you ask for? One day we all had our fur hats on and we decided to take a picture. But Scotty was visiting and he didn't get the memo, so he's the only guy in this picture who didn't have his fur hat with him. We stopped in at the village of Tananaw and parked our raft a couple miles out of town. Belle took a little tour and a couple pictures of this beautiful old church tucked out in the trees. What a nice setting. One of the reasons that we stopped in Tanana is Neil and Laurel were going to trap for the winter along the river. They needed to build up a little bit of a dog team. Well, they found this dog, Annie, for sale, and she was the first dog of their team for that year. Well, little did they know that Annie was pregnant with a batch of puppies. So as opposed to Laurel getting one dog for the price, Laurel ended up getting a whole darn sled dog team for one price. Now down the road, Annie would have several more batches of puppies. And now that Neil and Laurel were just dog rich, they figured they might as well put those dogs to good use. They started Skookum Expeditions. And if you wanted to go out and take a sled dog tour or a Aurora viewing with Neil and Laurel right now, you can find them up at the Yukon River Bridge. As they're using the Yukon River Camp as their base of operations for Skookum Expeditions. Now I don't know what kind of life Annie had in the village of Tanana. But when she joined our log raft, she became one pampered dog. She got attention constantly and the best of scraps. I think she was a pretty happy camper. Now one beautiful sunny day, we stopped by this little cabin on the banks of the Yukon. This cabin had once belonged to a guy named Bushy Charlie. Neil and Charlie knew each other back in the 70s and early 80s. And Charlie, from all accounts, was a guy who actually lived the life of a pioneer. He had very little, owned next to nothing, and lived right off the land on the banks of the Yukon. Now for the rest of that day, we just took advantage of the sunshine. We had really hit the jackpot when it comes to weather along the Yukon. It could have been a foot of snow by that time of the year, but we had great weather all that trip. Now that evening, just before dark, we floated through the boneyard. It's a two mile stretch of giant cliffs on the south side of the river where permafrost, permanently frozen ground, thaws out and then caves off into the river, almost like a calving glacier. Neil had spent a lot of time over the years on this section of river looking for fossil mammoth ivory. Now the boneyard is not just an amazing piece of scenery along the river, it's also a dangerous place. The boneyard has been known to swamp boats along that section of the river as blocks of frozen dirt, sometimes the size of a 10-story building, cave off the front into the water.
Now just south of the boneyard, we were treated to probably the greatest sunset on this entire trip. If I had to pick one moment on the entire float down the river that fall, that seemed to be the pinnacle, the peak, the highlight, the, the, the culmination of that whole experience, it'd probably be this evening. What a beautiful, beautiful evening to be in a beautiful part of the world. And not just the gorgeous afternoon and evening, but we capped it off with a beautiful night with a giant bonfire on a beach. Perfect. Now being that Neil and Laurel were going to spend the winter trapping along the river, fishing became a top priority at this point in the trip. Every time we would find a good eddy, we would stop and set out the gill nets. If you see that trash barrel in the middle of Neil's boat, that's where we would collect the fish out of the nets and put them in the barrel. In the evenings, we would split these fish at the tail, score all the meat, and hang it up to dry on the raft. Now sled dogs can't really eat raw fish, but if it's dried, or if it's been frozen, it's a perfect dog food. Now this is the cabin that Neil and Laro stayed in that winter. Once we were done with the float, those guys flew back and they trapped out of this cabin for that winter. We spent probably two or three days here cutting firewood, tidying up the cabin, offloading supplies, getting the chimney fixed up. Once we had the cabin all dialed in and livable, we set sail and finished our trip down to the village of Ruby. Taking advantage of the still water and the great weather and the lack of wind, a lot of times Scott and Tony would get out in Neil's canoe and they'd go around and take b-roll footage and pictures and, and you know just soak up the beautiful scenery. Now Brooke did most of the cooking on this trip. Not only is she good with a chainsaw and a rifle and an outboard, but she's also a fantastic cook. One of the things that really kept us going all this time we were out on the water was pie. Brooke made lots and lots of great pies. We kind of come up with a saying, you know, put some pie into it. Kind of like the old saying, put your back into it. Brooke had been selling pies on the weekends out of a little bake shop we had on our back porch. We kitted out the back porch of the old farmhouse and uh, quite, a, quite a little shop. Now sometimes it takes a brave captain with a fully automatic weapon to protect the pies from pirates. You know, that's where the term pirate comes from, is people who steal pies. Speaking of people that steal pies... Neil was always the first guy to get up, and if you didn't watch it, Neil would take a heavy toll on the pies. One day we found this note. Captain cannot be held liable for pies found in the cook tent in the AM. Final notice. <laughs> Here's a great picture of Laro cutting up some firewood as the sun goes down on yet another beautiful sunset as we park the raft just outside the village of Ruby. Now, I remember that night we were all playing cards. And playing cards with Neil is a losing proposition because he doesn't care at all about cards. He just likes to, likes to cheat, likes the opportunity to swipe cards and chips. Lots of fun playing cards with Neil. Now Juan, on the other hand, he was no fun to play cards with at all because he was good and he knew what he was doing. And he cleaned us all out. At the Village of Ruby, we had another chance to catch up with Scotty Lampkin and Charles Keeter. They were parked right next to us. You can see that box on the back. That was intended to be a uh, kind of a sauna, but it ended up being a chicken coop. Mick always liked to go down and say hi to Charles and Scotty and see the chickens. Scotty had uh, quite the setup in the middle of the raft. He had bought this giant wood stove in the village of Tananoff for 50 bucks, and he'd keep that thing just a roaring. It was always good to go visit Scotty and just sit around and tell stories soak up some heat, just visit. Scotty was great company and a great storyteller. One thing you have to be really careful of with a log raft is to keep it shoved off the shore. The water in the river fluctuates up and down quite a bit and you can see the edge of that log raft is high and dry on the bank. You get a 50,000 pound log raft stuck and it's darn near impossible to get it off sometimes. Took those guys the better part of an afternoon to pull that raft off the bank. In the village of Ruby lived a guy named Wolf Hebel. Wolf and Neil had been buddies from way back. They used to mine mammoth ivory out of the boneyard together. 
Here you see Neil on the left and Wolf on the right. Kind of like this picture of Neil on the left and Wolf on the right. Neil actually wrote a book called Alaska Ivory Hunter, and he used that picture for the cover. We spent a few days just outside of the village of Ruby, and when we were ready to leave, we shoved off on our last leg of the trip, the hundred some mile float from Ruby down to Galena. Now this little beautiful cemetery is kind of somewhere out in the middle of nowhere between Ruby and Galena. Now nobody wants to just pass away today, but if you did, ending up in a place like this wouldn't be the worst. Nice scenery right on the banks of the river. Now this picture I believe was taken right around October 1st. And October 1st in the middle of Alaska is anybody's game. You can see those clouds in the back. They started to look like winter clouds. They were carrying some snow. Now Galena was going to be the last stop for us that year. We knew that we didn't want to go any farther down the river that time of the year. At least not on this trip. Brooke took all of our dry goods and made a big batch of pies and cookies and cakes. And when we hit Galena, we had a great big bake sale. One thing you'll notice in all these pictures is the amount of smiles that you see. We were having such a great time getting back out on the water and, and doing this thing that we had all shared as a common dream. Whether we were cutting up or trying to make the other guy laugh or posing for a goofy picture, we had a great time that fall. Some of the nights in Galena got down to around zero. There was ice beginning to run in the river and it was no question of whether or not winter was going to be here any day. Mickey's trying to break the water out of the dish pan with his elbow in this picture. I think we all had just been run through the ringer and wore out. Charles and Scotty also pulled into town. It was great to catch up with those two. Also, Josh and Andrew pulled into town. You only see Josh in this picture because Andrew got really sick and had to get flown out of Galena. That was about the end of the trip for Andrew. Galena was also going to be the end of the line for us. Winter was just about here. It was threatening snow one day and then the next day it was going to get serious. Laro and I would spend the evenings splitting up firewood to keep the tents warm through the night. Always loved splitting firewood with Laurel. Remember me saying it was getting serious? Well, by the next morning, we had several inches of snow. We'd get up in the morning looking like a bunch of homeless people, have a cup of coffee and maybe a little bite to eat, and it was off to shovel the deck. And when you're living on the water and shoveling the deck, you know you're about done. We'd also shovel the boats, and that's even a better sign that it's time to wrap things up. When you have to shovel your boat out, it's time to call it a year. Well, we put the word out on the street that we were going to have a giant yard sale right there on the beach. Sell our tents and stoves and all of our equipment that we weren't keeping. Neil and I fired up the boats, pulled the raft away from shore and took it about a quarter mile down the river. And that was going to be the final stop for our log raft on that year's trip. Now we'd named that raft the Laura May in honor of Neil's mom. That raft was our home for the several weeks that we were out there floating the river that fall. That was a fine raft. And that's the last stop on the river for the Laura May. During our yard sale, we sold off all the tents and the stoves and the stove pipe. I think there were even a few firearms sold. Also a ton of fishing gear. I sold my chainsaw, my cant hooks. I think we sold a PV or two. All kinds of odds and ends, little bits and pieces. And by the end of the day, there was nothing left on the beach but the base of the raft itself. Right there on the beach in Galena, Bell and Mick rolled up a big snowball and stuck Fred the Tussock, our raft mascot, on top. Kind of a snow sasquatch. And that was the end of the line for Fred. He'd spend the rest of the winter there in Galena. And at the end of that evening, we all jumped on a chartered plane back to the city of Fairbanks. And we checked into a hotel in Fairbanks that evening with nice hot running water and good warm food. And it was sure wonderful to sit down with good friends at the end of a trip like that and really soak it in. You know, this is the culmination of so many years of hoping and wishing and talking and planning. This is a dream that had been set aside for another time. And this was the time. 
has an amazing triumph to it to to dream about something for so long and then have that dream resurrected brought back to life filled up with gas and run hard we had such an amazing time that year on the Yukon River and there's nothing like the Yukon River there's nothing like being in that part of Alaska that time of year and there's nothing like the smell of wood smoke and white canvas time well spent with good friends on a big log raft in a mighty river in a wild and scenic corner of the world thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come along on this trip with me my name's dave whipple and you've been watching bush radical and be radical eh see you soon <laughs>